All right, hello everyone. My name is Dr. Joel Rosen. I am the Adrenal Fatigue Recovery Ninja, and I'm really excited for another edition of your Adrenal Fix because I have my, my good friend here and, and special guest, Dr. Peter Kahn. Um, Peter is a board certified chiropractic neurologist and a fellow of the American Association of Integrative Medicine and a certified functional medicine practitioner. He's dedicated his practice to helping people with chronic conditions that have not responded to other treatments or have not met their goals using other methods. Um, he's created something called the neurometabolic integration technique or, or practice method. Uh, it's a revolutionary approach to treating chronic conditions by addressing the whole person and not just masking the symptoms through the combination of functional neurology and functional medicine. And patients across the country have come to seek him out for his integrative approach. And he's really happy that he can say that he's changed the, the lives of these suffering people. And his practice mostly focuses on thyroid and autoimmune disorders. These are 90% of the practice um, that makes up his practice that have thyroid or Hashimoto cases. But he also treats neuropathy, chronic uh, digestive disorders, uh, such as Crohn's and IBS and traumatic brain injuries and balance disorders. So um, Peter, I could go on and on, but we at some point have to get into the interview. But thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Joe. It's great to uh, have you uh, invite me on the show, and I just love to contribute in any way I can. Well, great. Yeah, why don't you tell us a little bit of your, your backstory? I know there was more in there that we can get to understand a little bit about who you are. So tell me a little bit about your, you, know, you personally, Peter. Sure. Well, I, I was not abducted by aliens or anything like that. <laughs> Nothing crazy. But uh, I, I moved here from uh, Taiwan when I was 12. So Growing up, my parents, you know, uh, they were very much into natural medicine already, you know, in the Chinese culture where oriental medicine is kind of like, you know, just part of our, how we live. You know, we always believed in eating this food to help with your brain, eating this food to help with your eyes. That's how I grew up. So that was very familiar to me until I went to college and I got a degree in exercise physiology and I thought I knew everything. And, um, and when I go through, went through chiropractic college, my father had liver cancer uh, and um, you know, he was told he had six months to live. And at that time, you know, my brother and I did everything we could to help him by researching into nutraceuticals and supplements and diet change. And uh, six months stretched into five years. He lived five years symptom free with stage four cancer. And that's before I knew anything, right? Like the little that I knew. So I knew it was very powerful that nutrition and lifestyle can have profound impact, a uh, profound impact on people. And then, uh, Fast forward, my one-year-old son, when I had a child, my one-year-old son had a severe scalding injury where hot boiling water spilled down the side of his body. He had third degree burn over 15% in his body. And ever since that burn injury, he started developing you know, neurological symptoms like night terrors every night. He, he had severe temper tantrums. He also has severe upper respiratory symptoms and, and allergies since that point. So, you know, of course I do everything to help my son. So I travel around the country got my diploma in neurology, dived into functional medicine. And that's kind of how I ended up here today to really, you know, out of a desire to help my own family and then apply that to, you know, the people that I see in my practice. Yeah, that's a great story. It always makes it more personal when there's a personal story and, and you live and breathe what you practice and preach. You have a lot of integrity in that way, which, you know, kudos to you and it, it, it makes it real. So um, I, I didn't realize you had an exercise physiology. I think you and I have a lot, a lot in common. I mean, I, I have the exercise physiology degree as well. We both went to the same chiropractic college and um, we both... Uh, do the functional medicine and the and the functional neurology approach so um why don't you tell me a little bit about um how you integrate the 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 neurology because i think people don't understand that part peter in terms of well i especially for my audience and and to your audience too they're exhausted they're burnt out um, they're not able to focus and concentrate maybe they crash throughout the entire day um, they have anxiety or or over overwhelmed with stress um, maybe they can't lose weight or they're not sleeping or they have musculoskeletal pains or they, you know, they're just not living life at the level that they want to. Sounds a lot, I'm sure, like your patient base too, right? So mm -hmm. how does the brain and functional neurology play into this? Because a lot of people may not even 
consider that as a as another avenue for healing yeah absolutely i mean brain is so important you know as chiropractors we always say that brain is the master organ and it controls everything but really until i really dived into neurology and, and studying functional neurology did i realize how profound that is and uh you know brain has its tentacles into the gut as we know the brain gut connection it has its tentacles into the immune function uh it has tentacles into even blood sugar function it has tentacles into the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis uh it affects endocrinology hormone function so brain is so important and a lot of people suffer from compromised cortical or brain function due to a variety of factors so not the least of which is you know, fuel, you know, blood glucose fluctuations, activation, uh, anemia, or they're inflamed, or heavy metal toxicity, or virus issues, or chronic infections. I mean, these are all things that affect brain function. So we can't, we can't simply look at brain function as in, oh, here's a supplement for brain, and it says brain magic, so it must be good for my brain. You have to really identify the underlying mechanism, and then use appropriate you know, interventions for whatever their root cause for that person is, instead of just taking something, oh, you know, it says serotonin support, 5-HTP, it sounds like a good idea. And you're just matching symptom to a supplement, which is what a lot of people do. And, you know, I, I speak a lot of, on that uh, to, to get people to understand, you know, that there's more to it than just a symptom-based approach. Yeah, absolutely. You see the same thing in, in holistic care as you do in, in medicine, unfortunately, where you have that reductionistic approach where, oh, if I have high blood pressure, take a high blood pressure pill. But sometimes what happens in the world of, of, of alternative medicine is I have high blood pressure, take this you know, high blood pressure control supplement, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and you see a lot of people that come to your office that have a little pharmacy in their closet of you know the thousands of supplements that they're taking and they're wondering why they're they're not getting better so um so okay so you you're very similar with me in the sense that uh you your your goal is to educate and, and provide content but also work with people that are from from far so so let, let's get an idea maybe we can compare notes in terms of what are some of the challenges or consistencies that you see with, or, you know, that's, sorry, that's a two-part question, challenges and consistencies that you see with the patient base that you work with in terms of just, you know, how you will work them up and try to help them? Um, as far as workup, yes, the consistency is that I always go through a, you know, like an algorithm that I have, you know, uh, or approach, a clinical roadmap that I have which is to address the primary things first. And so for example, in the case of adrenals, you know, people will come to me and say they have adrenal fatigue or they have adrenal issues. Then I will say, great, well, let's look at how is your blood sugar stability. And I will look at to rule out anemia or circulation problems. I will look at, you know, leaky gut. I'll look at other things that may precede the adrenal fatigue, right? So then the workup is such that we're, we're asking these questions, we're running an appropriate lab test so that we can identify these things that maybe they have not considered, or maybe it's a blind spot to other practitioners. And, uh, and as far as the approach, you know, the consistency is always, I start with blood sugar management, right? So we use, uh, you know, smoothies quite a bit because it's a great way for them to start the day. So I have developed these, uh, you know, uh, nutritional functional food powders and I teach them how to make a smoothie so that first thing in the morning, they can stabilize their blood sugar and then throughout the day as needed. So that's the consistency. The challenge is, you know, in people who have autoimmune, who are very compromised, who have multiple chemical sensitivity, that's like a monkey in a wrench or a wrench in the system because then it becomes unpredictable. We may stabilize the blood sugar, but if they have an infection, it didn't really matter how much we stabilize the blood sugar until we get rid of the infection, they're going to still have problems. So this is where a lot of detective work comes in. It's not a, uh, you know, one size fits all approach. There's no magic pill. You have to start somewhere though, but I will say that the place that I start is always from stabilizing blood sugar. Yeah. I think that's, you could, it, it's the boring 
it's the boring part of, you know, understanding. I want to look at this test. I want to do that. I want to look at my genetics, but really it comes down to a lot of the boring stuff, right? Like in terms of let's just make sure you're stabilizing your glucose. And, I've, and I'm sure you find this too, where you have patients that they don't look like the typical patient that has a blood sugar problem. Like it's, you would think like just as a, you know, a lay person, okay, that person who's obese and very heavy is going to have a blood sugar problem. But ultimately, um, when you have, like you said, these um, autoimmunities, chemical sensitivities, decreased activation and fuel to the brain, um, those can create a prime, those could be the primary problem for a secondary glucose problem, correct? Yeah, I mean, patients don't follow the textbooks, you know, as much as we, as we like to clump them or put them in a category with everybody else they sometimes just don't follow the rule. You know, we have like, just like you said, sometimes people are overweight and, you know, I was expecting, oh, for sure, there's going to be insulin resistance. For, for sure, the blood sugar will be high. And lo and behold, their HbA1c is a 5.2, is just fine. But that doesn't mean they don't have insulin resistance, right? So that, again, that, that's kind of gets into deeper into lab work because they may have high insulin, but the A1c is okay. And then we see people who have hypoglycemia and for sure, I thought that they, they wouldn't be able to handle intermittent fasting. And lo and behold, the hinder fasting is just fine. So maybe that's where genetics comes in. And certainly, you know, we, we're not treating the lab work, we're treating the person. So, you know, sometimes the lab work can look a certain way, but we ask the patient, how, how are you doing with that blood sugar? And if they're doing fine, maybe they are fine, right? So we have to then move on to the next priority for that. Yeah, you know, I just to follow up on what you're saying, um, I to just to give the readers or the listeners some really good nuggets of information. Um, and I agree 100%. You can see an A1C and it's 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 controlled, and you can see even your glucose, which was fasting from the night before and it was controlled. Um, but you don't see fasting insulin on a blood test. So I mean, that has to has to be there. And most of the time, you'll see that even below the ranges, I think most ranges show like three point something to 24 point something on a, on a lab range. And um, we really like to see it below three. I mean, that's what we like to see, but I, I very seldom see it below 15, you know, yeah. but it's not flagged over 24.9. So that's a big one to take home for listeners. Um, the other thing that, that I do along with you as in terms of controlling glucose is I just interviewed the uh, CEO of Keto Mojo, Peter, and it was a great interview in terms of um, the accountability of having a tracker um, so that you can actually calibrate your brain with what's going on physiologically. And I find that to be a huge uh, disconnect where patients are, are erroneous in terms of thinking, oh, I'm hypoglycemic, I'm hypoglycemic. And then they take their glucose levels and they're over 100. And, and so what I really like to teach is the idea of calibrating their brain with their physiology and, and sort of, and set that plasticity of, oh, that's where it is. So that's not actually a hunger. So that's difference between physiological hunger and psychological cravings. And of course we got to work and figure out why they're having those psychological cravings. Um, but I think it's a, a really important tool that you, that, you know, that, um, like you said, is really get them to understand their glucose, because that's one of the main inducers of not just HPA and adrenal problems, but I'm sure all the problems and inflammatory you know, problems that you're seeing as well. Yeah, it's under it's underlooked, and, uh, and it has a huge impacts on energy, mood, immune function, and I think um, that's where the biggest payoff is, right? If people can really work on that, and I really like the idea what you just said about. Uh, you know, having people track their glucose or even ketone levels. Uh, I think that's probably not utilized as much in my practice. And um, I think that'll give people their, their own data to hack themselves, so to speak. And of course, with a guide of a professional like you and, and myself. But um, I, I think, you know, you want to do things that will have the most payoff and the most impact. And right. working on blood sugar stability always have the biggest impact. And that doesn't mean that's the only thing there is to do. But I think that's the first step, right? It's a foundational step. I don't, I don't want to say it's a boring step, but I say it's a very foundational step. 
Right. It's not sexy, though. That's the thing. So but I, I would agree with you, too, in terms of I love the idea of what you've done with making powders and making sure that they have a great starting uh, breakfast with with a with a smoothie. And I'm sure there's probably a lot of other things in there as well that um, are botanical and supportive. Um, so so good for that. Good for you. So uh, as far as the next level, I want to ask you this. Um, I was a big Follower, and I think you probably were too, of Dr. Marshall from Premier Research Labs. And he talks a lot, Peter, about all autoimmunities, all autoimmunities um, are secondary to infections. And he looks at it in terms of, um, he, he cites a study from Punjabi et al. in Cambridge, and I, I want to say it was in the 90s. Um, and I'll try to find the reference and post it in the, in the notes here. Um, uh, but how do you find that to be true in terms of if most of your practice is autoimmune and, and Hashimoto's and, and other autoimmunities that still need to be uncovered because the body doesn't just say, okay, I'm going to stop here at the thyroid. Um, but how do you find um, that statement in terms of autoimmunities and the role of uh, hidden infections? I think it's really common, and I do find it very common in my practice, that the trouble with infection is, is difficult because let's just take parasite, for example. I mean, when you do a stool test, you're just measuring what's shed on the stool, right? And sometimes the parasite didn't shed on that particular stool sample. So, you know, there's, there's false negatives that can happen. So, for example, if someone come in with chronic GI symptoms, adrenal fatigue is one of those symptoms, but then they also have chronic diarrhea. But then we do a stool test and the stool test shows negative for parasite. Well, that doesn't mean it's negative for parasite. It just means it's negative for that particular stool test. So we may have to repeat the test or use other methods to test that. So that's just one example, you know, viruses also. When you want to check for viruses, you can only check the box on the requisition form of the one that you want to check, you know, Epstein-Barr or herpes simplex one, but you can't like, send in a drop of blood and say, hey, what, what are all the viruses that are in there? Because there's hundreds of viruses. So how do you check them all? So it's difficult, you know? So that's the challenge that we run up to uh, as far as looking for these infections. But again, I think if there's a clinical roadmap, so I follow this map. So we start with fuel delivery. So if their blood sugar is not stable, if they're anemic, forget about the virus. You're not going to be able to handle the virus anyways, right? So we got to make sure you're not anemic and you circulate, you don't have severely low blood pressure to where you can't even perfuse your blood. Got to make sure your blood sugar is correct. We got to make sure you're digesting food, right? Because once we get those things handled, then perhaps your immune system will be stronger or better able to fight this infection. So I see infection not really as an infection, like a foreign invader attacked you, but more like your defense is down so you can't fight off the infection. So there's a balancing point. You know, some people, I think clinically, you have to look at their history and, and you know, where they're coming from, what's the most significant symptom for them. Sometimes even though they have a viral infection, I may not go ahead, and even if it's documented like on the lab test, I may not go ahead and treat that right away unless I get the foundation in place. Another place where I feel like that's really important, I might start with a viral protocol and then as, as I work, you know, work on the foundations too. So, you know, I think, you know, a lot of people are, are keen on, you know, killing the infections. I, I'm more keen on the idea of rehabbing the immune system so that you can better defend it against the infection. Yeah, again, like I said in the beginning, so much similarities there, Peter, and it's great to hear the, your, in, your, your take on this because we all have different ways to look at it. Um, but that's the thing is in terms of, prioritization, right? You don't want to um, overwhelm the body when it's not prepared. I use the analogy, it's like a rookie cop seeing a crime scene go down right in front of him. And he's really eager to take down the, the, the mob, but he never calls for backup. He doesn't have all escape hatches covered. And next thing you know, and that's where we see a lot of people who, what they call Herxheim, or they go through a paradoxal reaction, which wasn't supposed to happen. And it's not a Herxheim, it's not a paradoxal reaction, it's an inappropriate response to, an, to the, to the sim, st, you know, stimulation that you gave the body that was grossly underprepared for what you made it do. I mean, it, the body's not dumb, right? The other thing I would say too, just, is, just to say what, you know, echo what you were saying, is that um, 
you know, all infections are secondary to, you know, nutritional deficiencies and nutritional imbalances. Like if we don't have the proper digestive functions, if we don't have the proper foods, let alone we're not even digesting the foods and they're crappy and there's not a lot of minerals or nutrients in there and it's contaminated and it has, uh, H, you know, GMOs and pesticides and sprays. Um, or it's just, it's synthetic, or it's, it's just, it's highly heated, and you're not, you're not going to be able to digest those nutrients, leaving, setting up the way for a nutritional deficiency, and then all of a sudden you have these infections that, that come out of that. So um, just to ask you one more, another question, Peter, on the, on the anemias, um, are you, what's your take on you know, the iron metabolism, because I'm sure you're seeing that a lot in terms of um, either having a, a lot of iron overload um, and sort of hemochromatosis and, and all the, you know, rock forms of iron in the foods and everything that's enriched or vice versa, where their iron loads and their ferritins are super, super low. So just to get a little bit of clinical pearls in that area, what, what are you seeing and how are you handling that? Uh, yeah, we see high ferritin a lot. And remember, a ferritin is an acute phase reactant, even though it's an iron bound to a protein, but it's an acute phase reactant, so it's an inflammation marker. So I see high ferritin quite a bit that's independent of high iron intake. So, you know, meaning their serum iron is normal to low and they don't have high red blood cell hemoglobin, iron saturation is normal, TIVC is normal, just ferritin is high. I see that quite a bit which tells me that they're inflamed. And then, then we got work to do, right? We've got to find out what's causing them to be inflamed. Um, you know, sometimes we do see iron overload in those cases, you know, if it's severe enough, I do send them out for a therapeutic phlebotomy or just to go donate blood just to get that out of the system because iron is really inflammatory. It's, you know, creates oxidative stress and, you know, we want, we don't want that to be too high. On the other hand, low iron is also very common. Um, and you could be subclinical low iron. And, and again, probably this is something you already have talked about with your clients and in your previous podcasts, but you know, iron deficiency is not the same as anemia. You know, you can have anemia without being iron deficient, right? You can have B12 folate deficiency. You can have other causes of anemia that's have nothing to do with iron deficiency and you can have iron deficiency without being anemic. So anemia technically is, you know, low red blood cell hemoglobin hematocrit, or one of those three. But you can have normal red blood cell hemoglobin hematocrit, but yet have low ferritin. And really, even if you have low ferritin, it's already considered iron deficiency. You know, according to World Health Organization, ferritin level less than 50 is considered anemic. And as you know, the lab range is anywhere between 15 to 150. So basically, any who, anybody who's alive is considered iron sufficient. So. Okay. We have to look at it differently. And again, again, we don't treat the lab. We have to consider that ferritin level along with their symptoms, along with everything else they have going on to make a determination whether iron supplementation is appropriate. And a lot of times they just have low iron just because they can't absorb. They don't make enough stomach acid or they have leaky gut or they have H. pylori infection. So again, it's, it's more having a, a clinical roadmap. So you know if you do something and it didn't work, what would you do next? So you're now stuck. And I think a lot of people are stuck because they thought they're banking on adrenal fatigue and they're taking adrenal supplements and they didn't get better and they didn't know what else is there. So this is a great you know, uh, thing that you're doing to get the message out that, hey, there's other things that you need to look into besides just adrenal fatigue. Yeah, you know, it's, I'll just sort of summarize what you're saying in, in, in sort of more of a, like a, a cliff note is, is that as the doctor, you have to put your thinking cap on, right? I mean, there's just no um, set, uh, although you have an algorithm, um, there, given that there's a lot of false negatives um, that, that you have to um, correlate what the patient's feeling with what the labs do or they don't say. And sometimes you have to trump the, the negative test result and ask the patient and talk to the patient and understand the patient what they're dealing with and say this doesn't necessarily you know this doesn't make sense and 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 put that part of that uh, um, that, stat, that data in back into the algorithm and and reset the course and so that's that's really awesome that you're doing that and I would also say the same thing in terms of ferritin 
Um, it, the, I tell patients the acute phase reactants mean it's just your body asked some, you know, the, um, the, the fire department reserves to come back and help fight the fire. And I really like the idea too, that you're looking at other values in the iron panels, which a lot of the times they're not even included, as you know, on people's basic biochem, on their, on their blood chemistries to know, okay, if this is independent of any other markers, then we know we have more inflammation versus if other markers are elevated or decreased, we know we have more of a iron deficiency problem or overload problem versus a, a, an inflammatory problem or both. Right. So um, that's that's really awesome that you're doing that. And then, you know, lastly, I would agree with you in terms of um, with the lab ranges. No one, you, you know, no one has no one has like a, an ICD 10 code of a, a perfect definition of, a you know, an iron deficiency, because a lot of the times I never see all three markers like sometimes you will, but all three markers, RBC, hematic, hemoglobin and hematocrit all have to be laboratory low. And if they're not laboratory low, but they're, you know, on the functional low and other markers for the size of the red blood cells are not laboratory high, but they're functionally high, they're just left. How often do you see that? They're just left and saying, you don't have this. There's your blood work is how many, let me ask you that. How many people do you see when they tell you, I almost licked my chops, Peter, when they tell me my blood tests are normal. Right. Because I'm like, OK, no way. Let's take a look at it. And then they're like crying, literally crying. And I'm like, why are we crying? It's like, well, because I knew something was wrong and no one ever told me. And here you are, the first person that's telling me. How, how often do you find that? Oh, quite a bit. And what the problem is that they're told that their lab test is normal. So they just assume that there's no problem there. So they don't even know that there's another way to look at the lab, to look at the functional ranges or to connect the dots, right? Uh, and remember, sometimes we do come back with someone with their lab, lab test is kind of normal. Then in that case, then you got to look at other labs, right? I mean, if everything's normal, you wouldn't feel the way you do, but a lot of times they just don't have the right test done. They just have blood tests, but perhaps they needed a salivary adrenal profile. Perhaps they needed a, a, you know, a stool test. Perhaps they needed something else. And the, the, what I, I don't have a problem with medical doctors doing their best to help their, their patients. I do have a problem with medical doctors, not when they don't have an answer, but don't give patient an alternative to say, hey, you may want to look at this with somebody else that can do this in a different way than I do. That's when I, when I have a problem because then people are stuck and they have no hope and they're left to get worse. I, I don't, you know, I don't agree with that. Yeah, I, 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 I've said this before, and I think it's a violation of the Hippocratic Oath in terms of not doing any harm. It's an error of omission, you know, in terms of um, if you're not aware of something, be, you know, be humble enough to be have the best interest for the patient and, at heart. So awesome. So as far as any parting information in terms of I always ask my guest, Peter, um, you know, in terms of in your own life and your own health. Um, and we're all under stress and we all get overwhelmed and we all have, you know, well, we don't all have four kids and a business and we're moving and, and wearing multiple hats. And so for your own adrenal health, what are some of the main um, key, like maybe the main bullet points that you would share with the audience that have sort of kept you grounded and you look as a, as a great sort of adrenal prophylactic protocol for yourself? What would you, what would you say those are? Well, for, for me, my personal practice, and I tend to, uh, you know, uh, lose weight really easily because I just have a really fast metabolism. So if I don't, uh, like if I get out of my workout routine and I don't, you know, if I don't work out, I tend to not eat as much. So I just shrink. So, uh, and I do get, and I will get hypoglycemic. At one point I had really severe hypoglycemic symptoms and literally like taking, you know, specific B vitamins, adrenal support and just make sure that I get my breakfast in literally reverse that symptom. So I know what that hypoglycemic symptom feel like, where you feel like you're just, you know, your hands, literally the blood's draining out of your hands and you just feel like you're going to fall apart. Uh, you know, I haven't had that for several years now and, and it hadn't even, it hadn't come back rarely, even though sometimes I delay meal and I intermittent fast sometimes. But I think for me that the go-to is, you know, my smoothie every day. That's just quick and easy, you know, make sure I get my breakfast in. 
Now, not, that doesn't mean intermittent fasting doesn't work. It just means that for, for me, that's what works for me. And for those with adrenal fatigue or hypoglycemic symptoms, for sure, that's the to-do. But I think the other thing that's really important, that's really overlooked, especially in the, you know, in functional medicine space is that we talk about diet a lot. You know, a lot of people are Googling online, what food do I eat? You know, and we're all focused on food and supplements, but for adrenal and just overall health, I think the managing stress, you know, as far as just having a proper mindset, doing meditation, deep breathing exercise, you know, just how you attack the day, I shouldn't say attack, how you handle the day, you know, from a perspective, like, you know, trying to be calm, you know, stay calm and keep marching on type of deal. You know, I think that's so important. And we could talk about food so much and talk about supplements that I think that's probably something that we all can work on. It's, it's really literally almost free to just spend some time. I and mean, it's not hard to meditate. You can download a Headspace app or, or any number of things to teach yourself how to meditate or just to deep breathe, uh, do deep breathing exercise. So I think that's one thing that I've learned to just stay calm in the face of challenges and stress. And that's really helped me a great deal. And I'm focusing that a lot with our clients. Yeah, no, great. And that sort of ties all the things together. I always say it's like a Seinfeld issue where you at the end, you bring everything together and it applies to you in terms of it's the, you know, the, the basics, right? It's keeping your glucose stable. It's making sure that you're getting good oxygen and you're, you're exercising your muscles and your body. And then, of course, the mindset in terms of how you process, how the central processor of the information coming in dictates how the information going out impacts the body. And it's either going to work to get you healthy or it's going to work to make you make you sick. So, um, Peter, thank you so much for being here in terms of how would the uh, listener get a hold of you and find out your information and so forth? Where what's your information? Yeah, I think, uh, well, one of the great, best places is just my Facebook page. You know, I do uh, a lot of videos just like yourself to educate the public on different topics. My thing is more thyroid autoimmune, not specifically focused on adrenal. So uh, if people have an interest on that, they can follow my Facebook page at Hope Integrated Wellness. My YouTube channel has tons of video as well at Peter Tom DC, has over 500 videos now. Uh, so that's a great archive of my greatest hits, if you will. And then my website's at uh, askdrkhan.com. Uh, it's also where, you know, I have a blog there where a lot of these videos are stored and uh, just a lot of great information. So. Okay, so great. So um, the easy one was Ask Dr. Khan, which was his K-A-N, right? Ask Dr. Yes. Right. So the other ones was a, a little quick. So where was the Facebook one again? Say it a little slower so we can get to make sure. That, yeah. It's our clinic name, uh, Hope Integrative Wellness. Hope Integrative Wellness. So they go to Facebook, they put in Hope Integrative Wellness, they'll come up with your page. Is it a prior, is it a private page or they can just get right on there? It's an open page and yeah. uh, you know, the page uh, it, it, when you search, the bald headed Chinese guy will pop up, pretty easy to narrow. <laughs> right, right. And then there was one more. So you had the, um, the YouTube page, Ask Dr. Khan, um, and then the Hope Wellness, or sorry, what was the, sorry, again, what was the? Yeah, fa yeah, Facebook page at Hope Integrative Wellness. And we have right. a YouTube channel, which is just my name, Peter Khan DC. And then we okay, have, great. Um, yeah, and we have my website. Okay, awesome. Well, good. Um, I know you got a lot to do today. I wanted to thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to help uh, my audience. And um, hey, man, I wish you a happy holiday and, and an awesome 2019 and, and hope to maybe do this uh, interview again with you. Sounds good, Joe. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Merry Christmas and we'll talk to you soon. Okay, bud. Take care.